I'm Gladys, um, and we're going to talk to you about the metadata management for our neuroinformatics platform. I'm first going to talk about our curation pipeline, and then Jan is going to come up, and he'll finish by discussing how we curate the computational models for the knowledge graph. So just hold any questions until after Jan is done talking. Um, at the core of our neuroinformatics platform is the eBrains or HBP knowledge graph, which we've already discussed. So this is where we share a wide range of very heterogeneous information from electrophysiology to morphology and the models. And within the knowledge graph, each of our curated data sets is represented by a data card like the ones that you see here, which contain metadata like the methods or any keywords that we need to make this card discoverable. And then in the knowledge graph search, you can filter through these data cards based on things such as species or methods, any of these tags. And this is our interface then for making the data accessible, searchable, and even citable. Data creation is the process of organizing and integrating data from various sources into a singular collection. So that's what we do. We take information <laughs> from institutes all over and we structure the metadata and organize it into our knowledge graph. Prior to entry into the knowledge graph, this data must undergo several preparatory stages. The provider needs to complete an ethics survey. They need to structure their data in files and folders in such a way that there's a strict naming convention that could be understood by others. And then they store their data for us in the long-term HBP repository. And a curator, one of us, will work with them through all these stages to make sure that no clarifications are needed, nothing is missing, and then it can be submitted to our three-tiered curation pipeline. So this goes in the order of basic curation, location, or atlas integration, and then our last stage, which is method-specific in-depth curation. For the basic curation, this is where we implement the data we've received, we validate it, and we register it in the knowledge graph. So this is one of those cards that I showed you earlier in a little bit more detail. It's expanded here. You can see the metadata that's been added to it, including things such as the contributors. We have the data files available for download. Each of the data cards gets a DOI. This is really important for making it citable in scientific works. There is the license, which tells users how to reference this and how they might use that data. And then also a link to any related publications for those who want to look at the work in more depth. So all of the keys that we have here associated with the data set, all the entities that we've added, give strength to the knowledge graph search. They make it queryable. Now, metadata has no value if it isn't standardized. It's critical that it is unified and that it's discoverable. And the way that the knowledge graph achieves this is through MINES, our Minimal Information for Neuroscience Datasets, a metadata standard. MINES requests that there's a certain minimum amount of metadata provided by the provider before anything is registered in the knowledge graph. And it also sets specific key value pairs. So we work with a controlled terminology, a controlled set of ontologies, and those define the name, type, and definition of different scientific terms and importantly, how those terms relate to one another. And in doing that, then, we're reducing variability within a data set and between data sets. For example, one data set can't be registered with the term parval Viewman as a keyword and another one as the acronym PV. They have to conform to the same conventions. We are designing minds with the breadth of neuroscience in mind so that it can describe all the diversity that we have in the data coming into the knowledge graph um, the diversity of the subjects being used, the data types, and the different experimental protocols. Because MINES has to be fit to comprehensively describe both an electrophysiology experiment from a rat and a human MRI experiment, and also show the common denominators between them such that they could be compared. This is the early structure of MINES, where our information was grouped into six core blocks each of which contain their own metadata. So there's the activities block, which contains information about funding and methods, the project block that links individual data sets, and then there are three blocks over on the right that describe the different animal subjects being used, and these are dependent in one another in such a way that you can't create a sample without attaching it to a subject or a subject without 
attaching it to a specimen group. So this is another representation of MINDS, where you can see the connections between activity, data set, and project, and then the interconnected specimen group box. And we quickly realized that this was a little too simplistic in order to describe all the data that we received, and it wasn't really utilizing the power of the graphical database. So now we have MINDS 2.0, where our six blocks are now 15. And you can see there's a greater amount of connections being made between each of these nodes. Sample before was connected to subject, and now we see tissue sample connecting not only to subject over on the right, but also back to the data set and the file bundle, et cetera. And in having more nodes and more connections, we're increasing the flexibility of our scheme. It becomes more scalable and more dynamic. So that's minds in short, but we have two further stages I want to discuss, the second one being Atlas integration. So the curation of location in the brain is what's going to make the data set visible in our HBP Brain Atlas tools. In order to visualize two different data sets in parallel, you need to register to them to the same physical or semantic space. And our HBP Atlas tools, they support a few different brain parcellation schemata and reference spaces, such as the Allen Mouse Brain Atlas and the Big Brain Atlas. And so, Based on spatial information, the regions of interest given in a data set, we can coordinate those with regions in our HBP-supported brain parcellation schema. We can register the images of ROIs, and we can register the spatial coordinates of ROIs. And then we have a really powerful tool available by which to compare two different data sets. Final stage of curation I'll discuss is our in-depth curation, which is specific to recordings of neural activity. This is tier three. So here we have a tier three curation workflow where we're taking any of the data sets available in the knowledge graph that contain either electrophysiology data or calcium imaging data, and we're extending the curation workflow. We're adding additional schema, metadata schemas to these works so that we can get more fine grain metadata associated with them. And tier three makes use of the neural activity resource, NAR, which is a collection of tools such as a web app, a Python client, and additional schemas um, specific to these recording data sets. So over here you can see our NAR browser where we have the data set separated out based on what methodology is being used. We have a Python client to increase the ease of access to these data sets. And we have additional schemas like this one here for a patch clamp recording, which as I said, are giving you a little bit more detail as to the experiment from which, which the data set is using. And it's also gonna include more provenance information. So information about the context of the recording, uh, the quality of it, and its potential for reuse and integration. So model data and sharing, uh, it's a really collaborative process, and we as curators are working to make sure that there's a high quality of the metadata going into the knowledge graph. We do that using those controlled ontologies that I described and constantly adding to them and adapting to them because this field is very flexible and constantly evolving. And we are always working to adhere to FAIR guidelines to make these resources findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And in particular note, we make these reusable by, as I said, increasing the accessibility of those data sets so that you can find exactly what you need within the knowledge graph. Having resources by which you can automate the analysis of these data sets and the visualization with those Brain Atlas tools. And in doing so, we can evaluate the quality of all of these data sets, we can replicate them and reproduce them. So. So Glynis covered uh, the <clears throat> all the ideas uh, about metadata management, so how it enables you to, to, to make data reusable. So I will cover uh, the specifics of theoretical models, and, uh, and also I will <clears throat> uh, cover how you know, from those metadata you can uh, gain something, because our group is actively involved in developing um, how uh, the reusability of models. So, uh, <clears throat> back to the eBrain's knowledge graph, so what I will cover here are uh, theoretical models. So, uh, what is curation in the context of theoretical models? 
so we have the same uh, co constraint than, uh, than for experimental data sets. So it's basic metadata anno uh, annotations, so authors, affiliations, contacts, uh, and also ensuring common language. Uh, you can, you know, some people might use different terms and we need to unify them at some point. And then um, there is an in-depth me metadata that is specific to models. Uh, so uh, there is first the metadata on the neurophysiological content uh, around models. So what brain region <coughs> do they co cover? What cellular types? Do they involve, if, that, if that's relevant, what is their abstraction level, uh, what are their model parameters? I mean, we really push for documenting model parameters as metadata. And uh, then uh, there is a higher level of, uh, of metadata, for example, data sets, because experimental data sets often constrain models. They do not come out of the blue. So we really push for you know, the, the, <coughs> the, the the, the, having the more metadata uh, linked to model to you know, s submit experimental data sets linked to models. Uh, you know, for example, uh, I should do an example here where a scaffold model of the cerebellum uh, relies on digital reconstruction of stained cellular morphologies. So those data sets, they highly constrain the model, so they should uh, be part of the metadata or voltage column recordings can, can constrain ion channel, uh, channel model. Um, so again, that's very important metadata related to that model. Uh, also softwares, uh, in the way models are numerically implemented, that's important metadata <coughs> for us. And then you can also imagine a higher level of metadata that is currently not implemented but uh, you know, models have capa capabilities or should be able to go through tests. And uh, so those are model validation concepts. I will quickly go through this uh, at the end of the talk. And maybe that could be included. Uh, then there could be metadata about you know, uh, experimental metadata in, in the knowledge graph. For example, a, a network model of a pen stage relates to Oh, no. the anesthesia or the slow wave sleep preparation. So you can have this uh, also, you, you could imagine this for specimens or experimental methods or techniques because usually models compute a, a very particular signal. Uh, so uh, the knowledge graph will enable this. And so the group is working to, to give this possibility uh, for metadata annotation to, to models. And uh, then I point to, to uh, the webinar of uh, Andrew Davison that uh, <coughs> described provenance tracking because you know, the way uh, a simulation was performed under w on what agent, so, uh, on what medium, and to produce what file, uh, this could be covered uh, in metadata by the, uh, within the knowledge graph. So uh, I quickly then go th uh, through the process of how model creation is done uh, currently in the HPP by our team. Uh, so maybe all of you are fami familiar with the HVP laboratory, and there is this uh, model catalog app uh, where you can uh, submit a new model, and then you will fill out a form where you, we ask for specific metadata and then this gives rise to the model catalog entry. And then there is a human curator review and some automated uh, knowledge graph cross-linking uh, using fair graph that will be presented later in this code jam. And this ends up in the, uh, this knowledge graph entry where you have the, the cur uh, current metadata th that we ask for. Uh, then I can give a quick overview of what is the status of model creation in the HPP. So this is summarized by, by those graphs. So we have the model catalog. That is a, a very large database of models. So here a given model is a given version of the model. It can update over time and this will be multiple model. Because for us a model is a, is a very, is a self-consistent implementation. It should be fixed. So um, you have all those models you can see. Uh, so we have you know, more than 300 of them. Uh, they cover uh, 
they are nicely splitted around all the brain regions uh, of the H covered by the HPP. Uh, they have different abstraction levels, model scopes, and different organizations are involved in this. And then, uh, so, uh, <coughs> in the e-brain's e knowledge graph, so far we've published much less because we're still uh, in the, uh, you know, many mo models are in the curation pipeline for, um, uh, for the M24 uh, report, and especially, you know, the bottleneck of this process is really that we, ch we try to push authors s that when they rely on an original data set, they should go through a, a, an experimental data submission. And then we will jointly publish the model and the uh, data sets together to have uh, 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 relevant uh, metadata for, for, for those entries. Uh, so that's our uh, M24 expectations uh, for the SGA2, the end of the SGA2 phase. Uh, so now I, I will uh, co cover a few benefits that we get from this model curation. So as Glenn is uh, stressed, uh, <coughs> it improves model sharing by making models fair, so findable and, uh, and accessible and inter interoperable uh, to this knowledge graph um, interface, search UI. Um, it makes them re reusable because you get all the parameters uh, that you need. And so something that the groups uh, actively, de that our group de uh, actively develops with collaborators uh, is the Realizing that model curation and metadata management enable the development of new tools and applications in neuroscientific research. So I will present to, to uh, very briefly two <coughs> two things. So how this metadata management enables you to interface with the other HBP uh, components, in particular the infrastructure component. The more we have as metadata, the easier it is to build a pipeline. To, um, to interface with those components. And then I will present the, the model validation framework. Uh, so yes, as I said, uh, if you have a standardized version uh, of near scientific models, and this is what model curation is about, it's standardizing uh, the, the, the metadata and ensuring that they are uh, here. Uh, so it really makes it easier to interface models with diverse platforms. So the HPP has the brain simulation platform with this neuron as a service, and we are actively working on trying to uh, get all the metadata from the metadata that we have in the model catalog, be able to you know, have a direct pipeline to uh, neuron as a service. Uh, and then, you know, well, could also imagine when it's compatible, uh, an interface with the neuromorphic platform, or e even for the neurorobotics platform, because you know, we have some in the model catalog, uh, some you know, cognitive models that would nicely suit for this uh, neurorobotics platform. So, and then another benefit is the model validation framework. So, uh, model validation is evaluating the empirical accuracy of a theoretical model given a set of experiment measurements. Uh, so, it's basically testing the, the model against data. Uh, so, imagine you have a, a model that is called my model version 2 that is a slight update with respect to your uh, model, my model version one. You would like this to go through a model validation service and have, uh, and so that it should be tested against a set of experiment of existing uh, experimental data, maybe stored in a knowledge graph, and then uh, that your model you will be ranked with respect to uh, other models. And uh, obviously, if you want to build this kind of pipeline and you know, make use of the uh, experimental data that are uh, available out there and produce within the project, uh, you really need to submit a data. I can go through a quick example. So imagine you have a model that has the capability of, uh, of producing spikes when you inject current. Uh, and <coughs> uh, so you need, uh, a possible test would be to evaluate the number of spikes 
uh, as a function of the input current. So that will be implemented in your library of tests. But I mean, you can see that it's very crucial that at the moment where you share the model, you nicely, uh, you know, you share model parameters as metadata, simulation parameters as metadata so that they can be compared across uh, simulation and you know, maybe a higher level of metadata that is those model capabilities. Because if we know that a given model uh, has the capability of you know, producing spikes uh, when uh, and receiving current input, you can you know, build a, a nice pipeline for all of this. So that was it. So just to summarize, so we uh, the content of our, of our work, the Cursion team, is available in the search UI. You can publicly access it. Uh, so the idea is uh, that curation improves data sharing by making models and experimental data set fair. And, and possibly this curation and metadata management work enables the development of new tools and, and applications. So that's it. I thank you for your attention. Uh, so many people are involved in this. So the tier one and tier two curation team of experimental data set is done uh, in Norway and in Germany by people around here and by us uh, at the CNRS in France.